Good afternoon and welcome to the latest Yellowstone Advisory webinar with John Burroughs, CEO of Oxford Biodynamics and Matthew Wakefield, Chair, who will present the fully results released this morning. Thank you, Alex, um, and good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for your time today. Um, now, it's been just over a year since I was appointed as chairman as OBD, and uh, it's exactly a year ago when John and myself did our first webinar um, detailing the roadmap um, for commercialising OBD's technology. Now, uh, in that webinar, we uh, gave a gave um, everyone who attended it um, details of our COVID severity test and the checkpoint inhibitor test, which is our flagship product. And um, we um, said that we that so the COVID severity test uh, was going to be launched in March and uh, the checkpoint inhibitor test by the end of September. Now, we fully acknowledge um, that uh, there has been quite a few delays, mainly to this uh, COVID severity test. And where we stand now is that the COVID severity test was actually hitting the, hit the market at the end of November. And we are literally weeks away from the checkpoint inhibitor test hitting the market. Now, this, is, this has been disappointing. And I'm going to let John um, elaborate on the logistical challenges that the company faced in getting both these tests uh, to market. But um, where we stand now is that so we have got all the commercial infrastructure in, in place. And I know for everyone attending this webinar, there's one word on your lips, and that is revenue. And again, I'm gonna uh, let John elaborate on some of the early signs that we've seen that uh, this commercial strategy um, that we've taken over the last year uh, has, has actually gained some traction. So um, without further ado, I'll hand over to you, John. Thank you, Matthew. Um, good afternoon to everybody. Um, nice to see that we've got a good turnout. The um, just let's get rid of this uh, corporate uh, disclaimer really quickly. And uh, give me a second while I set my screen. Okay. So let me elaborate on what Ma what Matthew introduced. Um, what it really comes down to is that we embarked on a very big project starting in March 2020 to change the group's fundamentals and focus so that we could go from being um, a very involved life science uh, research company where we were running a lot of academic projects and interesting clinical cohorts and, and picking up some work with pharma in, in terms of biomarker discovery and translational medicine. Um, while really having a very elusive, valid, but elusive commercial plan to, to try and capture licensing deals and companion diagnostics, et cetera. And you, you've all heard me on, on previous um, calls where what attracted me to this company was the treasure trove of data that the EpiSwitch technology had been able to put together through all of its R&D, but we were R&D heavy. And having run 10,000 clinical patients and having hundreds of millions of data points it, across many indications, it really made sense that we needed to concentrate on clinical testing and take control of our own destiny so we weren't having to wait for samples to come through the pharma contracts that we did or um, work with academic clinicians that had spent years building up a set or a cohort that we could use. And the beginnings of that happened in 2019 when I was first looking at the company and I was out at the um, immunotherapy conference in Washington, D.C., I met with Sasha and Ewan, and they were presenting their posters on the checkpoint inhibitor work that they'd been doing, along with Pfizer and EMD and Mayo. And I just looked at that and said, that test, that, that is what is going to make this company um, able to get on the market, and it needs to become a clinical test. So since March 2020, what we've done is we've really concentrated on making our fundamentals build around 
clinical epi-switch tests, and we now have two that are marketable, the CST in COVID and CERT for immuno-oncology, which I'll give you a lot more information about as we go forward. And we need to get out of the doldrums of biomarker discovery and translational medicine with pharma and drive them towards using our tests as for clinical development. And, and I think what we saw in 2021 was the ability to get that done. And a couple of, um, I think, proof points there. One um, was the awarding by the PACT consortium of the grant that really was for us to move forward and be funded to standardize the EpiSwitch technology as an industry standard for looking at 3D genome, uh, conf chromatin conformations and architecture. And, and that really has pushed this into the mindset of pharma. Pharma are coming back and talking to us very, very seriously. In fact, um, at the end of the year, before Christmas, we had four pharma that were talking um, with us we still have them talking with us. We put a proposal out to one of the big pharma that knows us very, very well to use the CERT test, which we're about to launch, but is available for them right now in hundreds of samples across two different indications in what can be multi-million dollar contracts. And the beauty of that is that that is not just validation of our approach that if we have clinical commercial tests, pharma will use them, but clinicians can look at that and say, oh, we need to be using that to make our decisions since pharma are using them to make their clinical development decisions. There's also a knock-on that can happen from that. And that is that as we work through hundreds of samples from clinical patients that are in the trials that are being run by pharma, they can see subsets in their cohorts, which they want more information about. And that drives work back into the translational medicine biomarker discovery. Let's understand what's happening with the systems biology area. So for the short term, the, the fact that we didn't stop working with farm, we continue to work with them through the pandemic has really paid off. And the fact that we continue to go through and build these tests is also starting to show signs of paying off. And of course, we haven't left the research behind. We've just commoditized it so that researchers can now come and use our kits and have access to our portal. And we've spent a lot of time um, in the last part of this year training um, people at our center of excellence that we've built in our new facility um, in Oxford because of travel restrictions, all of those people have actually been from Oxford University, but we will start pushing that out. And as people use these tests more and more, we, we know that right now in the academic research area, 3D genomics, we're seeing between five and 6,000 publications a year. We expect to be able to push that above the 10,000 level and really start to push the awareness of this technique um, into the hands of researchers who have very interesting questions. One other thing I should mention is that what we've done is we've put together a service where we help researchers write the use of EpiSwitch into their grants and into their budgets so that they can actually um, pay for it and start using it. So, I think what I want you to take away from this slide is that we have been able to reorganize our fundamentals and change our focus so that we are now in control of where we can go with the episode switch technology and that we're going to focus on the clinical testing part. On this next slide, with that in mind, I just want to remind you of, of what um, the products are for commercial in 2022. Um, the CST test is now available. It's also the CERT test, it will be available very shortly. 
the Explorer and Array Kit and the Portal Access is available and being used. You know, we, we launched the CST test initially in March of 2021, and we had a robot failure um, in April, and the test really went down for us. And, and this sent us into several months of going through a spiral of operational and logistical issues, which mostly were out of our control and centered around the difficulties of working in the pandemic, but the supply chain issues for parts, et cetera, really affected us. Um, and the inability of our technical team to travel was made it very difficult to work transatlantically to try and reconfigure and work through what we needed to do to bring this test back up. In fact, at one point, um, and, and this is something which really confounded us for a while, we couldn't understand why our extraction yields had failed and, and were low. And it wasn't until one of the tech team looking at a series of troubleshooting photos recognized there was a switch in the rotor configuration that occurred, which if we'd been on site probably would have seen straight away, but finally got to see it and change what was going on and get back on track. And then, of course, other things that have happened, including our samples and reagents that were continually getting stuck in customs after a while. And this was due to changes in COVID restrictions and labeling regulations. Um, we had a lot of, of ruined samples and lots that need to be replaced. Um, many things like this that we've literally had to walk th through. And I think the experience of doing that and hanging in there, having that grit and determination to um, do the work, to see it through, is really why in my statement I say that 2021 was a year of fortitude for us. And we've learned so much about the tech transfer, all the things that can happen and cut you off at the knees, um, that having got through that and using our time wisely, we applied all of that to the checkpoint inhibitor response test build. And now we're on the cusp of being able to um, put that onto the market. What what I can say, though, is that Omicron really didn't do us any favors either, because as soon as we got back up and running with CST, what we really faced was a market that was overwhelmed, it was confused, it, it still is, it, it's in denial, there's a lot of apathy and indifference, detachment from what's going on, um, it's actually a pretty tough nut to crack, but there is still a market for CST. COVID is still here. It's pandemic. It will go endemic. Our test is going to be relevant even when it's endemic. Um, we really do need the doctor to doctor engagement to, to get this moved along. And of course, bringing the CIRT up, we ran right into the back of that. And, and where we are today is that in December, we were right on track for getting the CIRT launched by the end of the year. And then our partner lab, its personnel were completely devastated by Omicron. We had less than 30 to 50% of the personnel able to go into that lab. They were overwhelmed by their own lab capacity and, and testing that in the contracts that they already had, the, the medical officer was out and this wasn't necessarily, as you know, from your own experience, because they were contracting COVID. They were being, they were in contact with people who did, so that they had to isolate five days at a time. We very quickly realized that we were going to have a delay in our final clinical validation, and that it really wasn't worth pushing this and messing it up, and that we really were better off to wait till after the holidays, after Christmas and New Year, get take the first several weeks of the year to get everything back up and running, make sure that we can dot the I's, cross the T's, have all of our um, marketing needs put in place and launch this test properly 
into um, in February. So we're back up to speed pretty much. And the question that we have to answer really is, so how are we going to sell this test, build the revenue, get a revenue engine going? And really what it comes down to is we need to get the market's attention with our test. Um, and we need to um, be focused on cert for sales and sales traction. Now, what I want to do before I show you that is just refresh everybody's memory um, and knowledge on what EpiSwitch is, because it's very unique and it's very powerful and it's the basis for everything that we do. So um, we have some of our marketing collateral here, which is very useful for um, approaching the people that need to understand and be comfortable with using this new technology. And, and Alex, I would ask you to tee up this um, video, please. Most people have 23 pairs of chromosomes. This is your genome. It contains around 20,000 genes. The DNA in these genes codes for proteins that make up your body, including your blood and immune system. But this coding DNA only accounts for one to 2% of your total genome. So what does the other 98% do? The remaining 98% is non-coding DNA and actively regulates your crucial genes it does this by folding the genome within the small cellular nucleus in a highly specified way, organizing your genome into a three-dimensional shape, bringing distant genes close together into a three-dimensional regulated network. When a cell divides, the genome is duplicated with a copy going to each daughter cell. The exciting part is that this 3D shape is also reproduced and conserved in the new cells, like a cellular memory. The genome's 3D shape is just as important as the genetic code it contains. The 3D shape imposes layers of regulatory and environmental exposure information, known as epigenetics, on top of your unique genome. This unique shape is a current snapshot of what has happened to you and you alone during your life known as your phenotype. At Oxford Biodynamics, we have pioneered interpreting how the genome's 3D structure influences your genes in both healthy and unhealthy conditions. The 3D shape of your genome controls how your body will respond when you get sick. Understanding 3D genomics is key to diagnosing disease, predicting drug response in patients, and determining immune health and disease severity. Because of this, Oxford Biodynamics has built EpiSwitch technology to measure the 3D genome from patients' blood samples. It gives crucial quantitative and actionable information to aid doctors, medical researchers, and pharmaceutical drug developers. Today, Oxford Biodynamics is advancing personalized healthcare using our EpiSwitch 3D genomic platform to develop precision medicine tests for COVID-19 severity, immunotherapy, rheumatoid arthritis, prostate cancer, and more. Find out more about how we're revolutionizing precision medicine at www.oxfordbiodynamics.com. Thank you, Alex. Um... What I can say is that that is a very powerful animation and video when we show it to um, our prospective pharma partners and we start our conversations with clinicians um, because they really want to know what, what underlies our technology. And there's no better way to do it than, than to use an animation like that. And as you can see, it really shows you the uniqueness, the innovation, and how powerful um, and different EpiSwitch is. So the second animation also shows you how our EpiSwitch now is being used and applied to build tests like the checkpoint inhibitor test. 
When fighting cancer, how can you know that doctors have all the tools they need to match their patient with an effective treatment? Every cancer patient travels a unique and different route. From diagnosis to treatment, while navigating complex decisions with their doctor. Fortunately, many cancer patients can be considered for checkpoint inhibitor immunotherapy, a different approach to chemotherapy or radiation therapy. Checkpoint inhibitors work with a patient's own immune system, helping it to find and fight cancer. However, Doctors must often base treatment decisions on tests identifying common genetic and protein patterns in a biopsy cut from a tumor. Unfortunately, these tests overlook a patient's individual immune signature, and the results leave a lot of room for interpretation. This is why most patients given checkpoint inhibitors do not benefit and can be seriously affected by the side effects of toxicity. But what if there was a way to determine who would benefit from checkpoint inhibitor therapy? Oxford Biodynamics developed the Checkpoint Inhibitor Response Test, CERT, which is the only smart blood test that specifically identifies a patient's likely response to checkpoint inhibitor therapy. EpiSwitch CERT is a routine blood test that generates results that can be trusted and used by your doctor to develop a more targeted treatment plan. The CERT was built using EpiSwitch technology based on a comprehensive and validated approach to reveal the most important drivers that control a patient's immune health. The CERT adds real value beyond existing biopsy-based risk assessments. Our approach combines this expertise with our EpiSwitch database of real patient immune health data, the world's largest, to give you an easy to understand private report. This report includes an accurate prediction of the patient's personalized response to therapy. CERT is a diagnostic tool that is used prior to treatment to inform a doctor who is considering whether to recommend checkpoint inhibitor therapy or not. This can help avoid unnecessary therapy in those predicted as non-responders. A positive CERT result gives both doctor and patient the comfort of knowing they are likely to respond to their course of checkpoint inhibitors. Cancer continues to affect many of us, but we are confident that smarter testing will help guide us to better choices for therapies to maximize their benefit to patients. Learn more about the power of our comprehensive immune health profiling approach at myobdx.com slash CIRT. Thank you, Alex. Thank you very much. Um, so these are examples of the collateral that we've built that is, is very powerful to um, engage with um, the stakeholders in the marketplace. And on this next slide, why is it not going forward? On this next slide, what I want to talk to you about is, is how we are tackling selling this into the market. And our flagship product has to be the CIRT test. It is um, what we're focusing on for 2022. Um, that's not to say that we aren't also working to also uh, push CST in, into into the uh, COVID patient testing, but we're really putting most of our effort into this flagship product, which is our focus. And um, we expect to launch very soon in February. We have identified the initial miscellaneous billing code for molecular testing that the doctors can bill against so that they can use the test with their patients. We have uh, we are establishing test adoption with our oncologists. We need to build what's known as a utility dossier as they use these tests and take that continually to the payers so that we can walk up what we call the reimbursement ladder and get our own code eventually that will 
reflect the true value in the marketplace of this product. The um, collateral and proof sources, some of which you've just seen with the um, videos, are very, very important. They're complete. Uh, Med Archive CRT publication for the physicians um, was published in December. Our CIRT landing page for physicians only is teed up and ready to go. Um, you saw it at the end of the video. It's uh, myobdx.com uh, slash CIRT. You won't be able to see that until this goes live, but when it is live, you'll be able to get to that page and see what's going on. It's important to mention here that this landing page is for physicians only and not patients because physicians are the gateway to ordering this test, using this test, deciding how and which patient um, they should order the test for. As you've seen the video animation, the print explainers are all set up. The order forms online in the landing page, the customer service lines at Ring Central, et cetera, are all ready to go. Um, and the proof sources through the PACT grant to establish us as an industry standard that I mentioned earlier, and the fact that pharma are using it in their clinical development are very, very important to the physician groups to validate this and make them understand that this isn't something that has just come out of nowhere, that it does have a lot of support and validity. So the approach is a direct to sales of, um, with the oncologists. We have a sales and uh, market access team that has been in training, is, is still training, will always continue to train. You can never learn enough about um, your target audience and, and people who are going to buy and use your test. Selling scripts are developed and will continue to evolve. We have been talking to and pre-selling to um, our early adopter list of oncologists. That's allowed us to have the voice of customer capture, which is really, really important, and to be able to create market awareness prior to us launching the test. And, and I can tell you that the voice of customer capture has really opened our eyes quite a bit in terms of how doctors look at a test like this and where they may think about using it. For us, it's always been this test is perfect for a doctor when somebody walks into the surgery and says, uh, and is diagnosed with cancer and is now gonna be an oncology patient. 44% of oncology patients actually turn out to be eligible by the criteria that are used by doctors here in the US for a checkpoint inhibitor. We know that only about 30% of them actually respond when they go onto that drug. The opportunity with this test for a lot of doctors is to have the information about the likelihood of response prior to putting their patient on a checkpoint inhibitor. However, as we've gone through the voice of customer, what we found is that, and this always happens, doctors are thinking way ahead and they're saying to themselves and to us, well, I could use this with patients who've already been on that, for example, have, are on and have been on for three, four, five months, and I'm seeing progressive disease that hasn't even stabilized, um, and I'm trying to figure out whether I keep them on, if there's any chance, or if I just take them off and move to the next level of treatment with them. And that's the sort of thing that we're trying to build into the market. Other things that we've heard are, well, often I get patients after, after the first couple of months who have low grade adverse reactions. As I keep them on it, it may go to, from a grade two to a grade three to a grade four. It would be great to use this test because now I can find out if they're going through this toxicity, what's the likelihood of them even responding if I keep them on or if I take them off, give them what's called a drug holiday, and then would I put them back on or not? If I know what the likelihood of response is, I can make those decisions in a much more informed way. And then 
the next piece on here is uh, is digital marketing campaigns and i have to tell you that during the pandemic and covid digital marketing has really come to the fore people are using their devices um, they're on their mobiles and their desktops their tablets we know um, working with two of uh, the better groups at this uh, out of New York, Glue and Silverlight, that when you do the SEM and the SEO optimization and you start running these campaigns um, where for the physicians, for example, what you're doing is you, you first of all, when they go online to things like um, JAMA, New England um, Journal of Medicine, et cetera, they see ads that are tailored to them. And these are the sorts of things where we can start getting um, advertising that will drive them to our landing page, et cetera, in front of them. And what we're finding is that when doctors have patients come to them, they do go look at all of the validated proof sources, the peer reviewed proof sources and they see them in those journals they do start talking to each other about this and um, what we also know is that a lot of the time they do it in their spare time on their mobiles about 80 percent of the time so this is a very important base for us to cover and and it's something which um, we have working as we go forward excuse me for going on too quickly there so that's our everything we've got in place that's our strategy it's happening um pre-launch it'll be obviously happening in spades post-launch it's another opportunity for us to show our grit and determination and to go and start executing on getting those initial sales building traction in the oncology testing market so Moving to the next slide, what does it take, though, as a company to support all of that and to grow to support it? And I think a really important thing if, that you can see here is that we have the infrastructure that we, I think, sensibly invested and committed to in the UK in 2021. And in September, we brought a new facility on board 24,000 square foot facility at the Oxford Business Park with the offices and meeting rooms to grow the team, custom design spaces for all of our lab operations, for our manufacturing and sample and consumable storage. But really to, if you see here, to support all of these different activities and testing lines that we need. So we need to be able to support the clinical tests and the product lifestyle of our tests as they go out. The test evolves and gets better and better as we bring more and more to it. We have ongoing product development for our portfolio as we go forward in 22 and into 23 to launch more tests. And you can see on the right-hand side here what our product development portfolio looks like prostate cancer, colorectal cancer, and veterinary medicine are places where we are very actively involved. Um, the pharma development projects, with the clinical development and the clinical trials work that can filter down also into side projects on translational studies and biomarker discovery is also something we need the dedicated lines for. The EpiSwitch Explorer Kit Training Center and access to the portal tools, et cetera, very, very important to build that out. And there are a myriad of internal R&D projects continually going on. So to finish up in a timely way, in summary, I think what we've able to show you today is that we've successfully reorganized our fundamentals during COVID to focus on the three pillars of molecular diagnostics for, for success. And two weeks ago, I was out at the JP Morgan meetings in San Francisco. And I can tell you that every presentation and conversation I had about molecular testing and the diagnostics fields and what 
the future of it looks like and what has driven success in the established companies in 2020, 2021, and they expect to in 2022, are focusing on these three pillars here, the clinical diagnostic testing aspect, working with pharma in, on clinical development projects, and having a life sciences research base in, our, in tools, kits, consumables, etc. The other thing that I think that is important to take away from this is in 2022, our commercial focus is and will be on clinical testing, the checkpoint inhibitor response test as our flagship. It's highly relevant and there's a clear medical need. Um, we need to capitalize on that. As I've told you, Big Pharma is talking with us and they are serious about using our commercial test. And this allows us to have to be masters of our own destiny with this, not waiting for their samples, but having them come along and ask us to run our test. And that is indeed what's happening. They're approaching us. And I really want to make sure that we take away that a key success factor was the build out of the UK infrastructure to support the commercial strategy. And, and I know that often it's hard to see a, you know, above the waves, what's going on, what are we doing? Is there progress, is anything going on? But believe me, if you look underneath, we are running, pedaling, cycling, moving constantly as quickly as we can and taking on all of the hurdles that come our way to make a successful business. Um, but the real plum of our business is this, the checkpoint inhibitor response test, which is going to be on the market very soon and we need to make hay. So um, I'll stop right there and um, Thank you for listening to me and for your attendance and, and throw it over to Alex for questions and answers. Well, thank you, John, for that uh, presentation. Um, it's encouraging to hear about all the foundations that are in place. And as we go to Q&A, um, quite a lot of the tone is around about revenue. Um, so we'll ask some of those questions. And just as a reminder, if you do want to ask a question, please type it into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So um, we'll start off just on, um, well, I'm going to group together a few questions on, on revenue that have come in. Um, the first one, um, you call the CRC, the CERT test, a flagship product. How much is a test likely to cost a patient or their healthcare provider? And how big um, is the market? Yeah, that's actually a beautiful question and an exact question for, for everybody to ask. Um, we have a miscellaneous code right now that covers mole complex molecular testing like the type of testing we do. And it bills anywhere between $2,600 and $3,500. And this is very, very important because without there being a code to bill against, the oncologist is not going to use our test. The alternative would be for the patient to have to pay for the test. And they do not want to put the burden of those types of tests um, on the patients. The fact that we've been working very closely during 2021 with the payers, with the payer groups to understand how we have to um, do this and have been directed to use that code. And it's a code that clinicians are familiar using um, has, has been a testament to what our clinical operations team and actually our COO, Tom Gill, who I should put a call out for, has worked very hard to make sure we have in place. Um, as to the second part of, of the question, um, can you refresh my memory what the actual wording was? And the question was, how big is the market? Um... Yeah, okay, so there are every year, 250 to 500,000 um, oncology patients that are eligible to go on a checkpoint inhibitor. And, and, and obviously there, this is a multi-year um, therapy. So there, let, let's just say there's 500,000 people or even 250,000 a year that are coming in 
We, we have millions of people who are being treated for cancer and, and on checkpoint inhibitors. And as I said at the beginning, you know, around 44%, according to the literature, this is the clinical literature, will actually be put on an inhibitor. We believe that there is a lot more than that, that there are a lot of doctors who are under pressure from their patients because of the massive advertising that goes on, on TV and in print. Um, we're a patient saying, Doc, you, you cannot deny me the opportunity for this drug, knowing darn well in the doctor's mind that a lot of them are barely on the quality of life scale um, metric for being able to go on a treatment like this. And that even if they are eligible, 70% of the time, within nine months, they're going to not have responded, probably gone through adverse events, and, and more to the point, not been able to get on something else that would have helped them. And the out of pocket, even though insurance is paying for most of it, is still significant on the patient. Um, a couple of follow-up questions to that, John. One is just on the reimbursement code. Just to clarify, have you got the reimbursement so code all sorted out? Indeed, we have the initial reimbursement code, which um, the payers have pushed us to. This is the one you should use first. And let me talk about what I, what I embellish a little bit on the utility dossier. In order to get paid for a test, it has to have usefulness. It has to be contributing to uh, significantly at those sort of prices, right? To the ability of a doctor to make an informed decision. And the miscellaneous code sort of a catch-all for tests that are molecular that come into the market that can be used. You have to be very, very careful um, to capture that data and keep representing the data on its utility and usefulness to the payer groups, to the medical directors of what we call the MACs, which are the geographic areas that control how reimbursement is, go is going to occur in the US and convince them that you are worthy of using those codes and indeed, with the data, you ought to be able to move to other codes which may be more lucrative and at the end of the day, produce a, a dossier, a clinical data dossier, which allows you to justify the ability to get your own molecular code, similar to what companies like Foundation Medicine and Garden are um, have done. And, and I can tell you the list price for the Foundation Medicine blood cancer tests is $7,000. Now, the average selling price, what they capture for that is between three and $4,000. And of course, a lot of what they've done, which we would love to do in the future as we build this use case, is go to medical systems and put contracts in place for them to use thousands of tests a year at a premium price like that. Um, again, following on from this, the question here is, how does the cost of the CERT test compare to the cost of immune check inhibitor monotherapy? Yeah, that, that's one of the reasons why I call this a, a flagship product, because until now, there really hasn't been a good way to determine who will most likely respond to what is a very expensive um, treatment. The average monthly cost to payers, which is split between payers and, um, and patients, is about $15,000 a month for the infusion treatments. Um, and when you consider the economics of for $3,000 test, you can know whether to pay up to $200,000 a year for a treatment or not, that, that's massive, right? And that's part and parcel of 
why we're getting the attention of the payers and why they want to see this be successful. And, you know, $30 billion in just in the US was spent on immunotherapy checkpoint inhibitors last year. And when you look at when you look at that, at least 10 billion of that didn't need to have been spent. And, and I want to be very clear about health economics in the US. Um, you're always going to spend the money. There aren't savings. What there are, what there is, is a redistribution of, let's say that $10 billion to places where it will help, can help, will be effective. And so the, the complexity of this equation is how do you move the 70% of the people who won't respond both economically and clinically into something which gives them more opportunity to get that partial response or if you can, that complete remission. Okay, I'm just continuing on the CERT test. Um, the question here, will CERT be harder to sell to oncologists without FDA approval, um, which would provide a stronger independent rubber stamp regarding accuracy and validation? So, I sort of take exception to that because an FDA test is a, it's the same test that you have in a clear uh, LDT laboratory. It's just gone through a much larger validation, a bigger dossier, et cetera. I, I'll, I'll give you an example. Well, let me back up. Selling tests as lab developed tests in the US is, has, has been established for a long, long time. Every company does this at the beginning. Some of them go to get the FDA approval. A lot of it is to actually close the door to competitive products coming in. That's not saying you wouldn't get it and it doesn't sometimes help justify a really large price, but it doesn't always. And if you look at um, what Garden CEO was saying at JP Morgan, they are looking to get FDA approval for their, I think it's their 360 test, but they're launching it as an LDT right now until they do. That's a great idea. That's a great strategy, especially when you have the organization and, and the resources to do that. Starting off in an LDT though is very, very good. There's a very important industry um, I guess it's marker from a few years ago where a company called Mammaprint was putting a breast cancer um, test on the market in the US. And instead of putting it out as a clear LDT, they went through the FDA route. A couple things happened. Oncotype DX put a similar test out, went through the LDT, too clear. We're first on the market, owned the market, Mammaprint didn't get a look in, and it took Mammaprint another five years and tens of millions of dollars to actually get some market share, even though they'd eventually got the FDA approval. And the average selling price of the test didn't significantly change. So you have to be really careful with how you do that. And that's why I think the expertise of, of the team here we have in the US and the knowledge of how it all works is holding us in good stead to go up through the gears um, in a way that is good for the company. Okay, thank you, John. I've got two more questions on sales here. Uh, first one is, when you say you're talking to four pharma companies with potential million dollar contracts, when would we hope to get some news on this? Is this something we should see in Q1, Q2, given your mention of short term? Yeah, and you know, this is really a, another fundamental question, which um, we put our first proposal out in the middle of December before Christmas. And we obviously, what happens, you have a company like ours that can turn on a dime and, and, and really move quickly. Farmers not like that, you know, farmers going through all their budgets. Luckily, we got the first proposal to a big farmer out before Christmas. We will hear about that in Q1. We're still talking to them. We're asking them where everything is. 
we should see what's happening with that in Q1. Um, the other three companies that we're talking to, and two of them are very, very interested in getting to know what we do and the experience that we've had through COVID with, with working with Big Pharma and putting the publications out on, on how we do stuff are really helping to get them up to speed. I think that those contracts are going to go to proposal probably in February, March at the latest, and then go through what I call the pharma cycle. So we should see those middle to later in the year. Okay, thank you. And then the last question on sales we've got here is, could you give some indication uh, for the uh, COVID severity tests? How, how's that doing in sales? So we're not giving guidance on sales at this point, but what I can tell you um, is that it's a hard sell and it's, it's something where, can you guys see my screen? Yes, we can, John. Oh, great. So I actually want to share this slide with you that maybe can help shed some light onto where we are with this and what's going on. So I'll, I'll jump right down here. We know that COVID is still here. Um, we know that there's still a significant market for this because in the US, um, only not everybody's vaccinated. And we know that the non-vax numbers are between 22 and 52%. So if you look at Idaho, 52% of the population in Idaho is not vaccinated. If you look at Maine and Rhode Island, Vermont, um, New Jersey, New York City even, you're in the 20s, 22, 25% of people that aren't vaccinated. The thing about this is you ask yourself who needs it, but you also, as soon as you start talking to people about anything else with COVID, you come up against this denial, this apathy, this indifference, this really, there's a confused and outlook and a lack of clarity. And, and let me give you the ends of the scale here, okay? There are people who are vaccinated, boosted, take precautions, stay away from people, only do essential things, um, and they're just getting on with their life. They're not people that are even interested in hearing about the severity test in the most part. Um, people who aren't vaccinated can't get vaccinated for whatever reason here. They're really in that box of, they don't believe that there's anything else that can help them. And even when they hear about this test, and it, if you look at the collateral, it's been published on now in two big places for the medics and for the scientists. The landing pages for the physicians and patients are up and running. We've got the animations going. We ran a digital marketing campaign in December, which we ran to all the sorts of groups that are at risk for this. And we had thousands of hits, people looking, but nobody ordering. I can tell you that 80% of the people who, who looked were patients, 20% of them were physicians. Um, what's going on here is that what we've realized is because we're still in the pandemic, we're gonna go endemic. We really need doctor to doctor engagement on this. And so the Prime Meridian group who did our early work with the concierge doctors is back talking to the concierge doctors getting them to understand that this test is available and that there are people that they ought to be using it on. And so that's where we're driving the sales right now and the marketing initiative um, with the CST test. Okay, thank you. Uh, moving on outside of the uh, sort of questions around sales here, uh, we've got a couple on the share register. Um, I wondered if you could talk about um, share ownership from yourself and the CFO. It appears to be quite low. Um, and is, is there a reason for this? I quite honestly can tell you that the reason for me is I found it incredibly difficult to uh, residing here in the US to actually set up 
the ability, uh, other than going onto the pink sheets, to buy the stock. And um, so, so that's where I am right now. I know that we've had some support today from other members of the, uh, of the directors, but um, that's what I can tell you personally about my position with it right now. And I, I seriously can tell you that we, there's a massive arbitrage, as you can see, we're very much undervalued. And um, with all of the fundamentals that we have in place and the ability to get sales traction and grow in the year, um, I, th I think the, the stock is a steal. Could you um, talk a little bit about the armistice uh, placing and the benefits of bringing them onto the share register? Um, and also in that uh, question, could you also comment about the warrant issuance? Yeah, um, and Matthew, jump in. Um, sure. But where I am with this is, you know, our market is in the US for commercial. And that's where we've got to crack the nut first. And Armistice were interested to support us and to continue to support us going forward. We needed to do the placement um, of the shares to um, recharge our coffers as we faced the headwinds of 2021 through COVID. And it made a lot of sense to bring on um, a US fund that would help us build a bridge from the UK into the US. And as we go forward with the growth of the company, um, be able to participate in subsequent uh, fundings and, and whatever we need to do to um, make the company successful. Um, I think, John, I'd just uh, interrupt on that. Um, yeah. <clears throat> I've seen some comments uh, on sort of chat lines, et cetera, et cetera, about you know, the warrants being free. Um, yes, it was an incentive for Armistice to, uh, to, to, to get the warrants, um, but you do remember they, they do have to pay for these shares. They, 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 will, they will get no benefit um, uh, having the warrants unless they subscribe to shares at the strike price of the warrants, which is 58p. So, you know, again, that is another way looking forward that, that, that the, the coffers will be re replenished. Well, the other thing that I think is a little bit different also in the dynamic between the UK and the US is that this is a typical deal in the US where when you buy the shares, you also do get warrants involved in the deal. So you're quite right, Matthew. And, and actually what it represents is that um, Armistice are in it to stay. And the warrants are very valuable to them. And, and they're not only a placeholder that keeps them involved in the company, but it's also part and parcel of them needing to continue to support us as we grow through 22 and 23. Okay, uh, thank you. I, I'm conscious of the time. I think we've got time for one more question. I, I do apologize if we haven't been able to get through all the questions. We've had a lot coming today and I've tried to go through as many as possible. The last question here is, can you talk about the competition in cancer diagnostics? For example, Grail, which is a broad based uh, using blood and other independent providers focusing on specific cancers but much cheaper than Grail. Um, and if you could uh, answer that succinctly, John, that would be appreciated. Much, sorry, much cheaper than what, Grail? Grail, yeah. Well, you know, Grail is looking, basically it's a prevention play, right? They're looking for, are you gonna get cancer? They have pan cancer and then they have other particular cancer indications that they look at. So it's, it's very different from what we're doing, but let me talk about Grail really quickly as an economic play. Grail, um, you know, prevention and prophylaxis in, in diagnosis has never been a very big play. And the type of tests that we have where you get actionable information that tells you what's gonna happen to your patient in, in most likelihood, it is, is the place to play. If you look at Grail being bought by Illumina, that's a massive play for content by Illumina where they need to extend what you can do with NGS. And yes, you can have upfront screening um, for pan cancer and you can say to people at your yearly uh, physical, 
give us your blood and we'll tell you if uh, there's any potential for you to develop prostate, colon, lung, whatever it is going forward. Um, it's cancer diagnostics, but it's the other end of the scale from where we play. John, thank you very much for that. Uh, Matthew and John, thank you very much for your uh, presentation this afternoon. Uh, this brings us to uh, the end of our uh, webinar with Oxford Biodynamics today. I'd just like to thank you all for attending. I'd like to thank you, John and Matthew, for presenting so clearly and answering all those questions. And just to remind you, um, there will be a feedback form as you leave today's webinar. And if you get an opportunity to complete that, it'll only take a couple of minutes. It'll be very much appreciated. So uh, thank you for attending and we hope to see you all soon. Thanks, Alex. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.